Hi, my name is Dave, and I'd like to tell you a little story about why I'm sitting in my kitchen at 2.30 p.m. on a weekday when I would normally be at work. You see, I'd like to justify the four phone calls I've made and one text I've sent since I've been sitting here. Let me see now, two hours already. One hour and forty-five minutes of stewing and fifteen minutes of action that have ruined God knows how many lives. You see, excuse me, someone is at the door. Oh, hi, sweetie. Where's Fiona? I rang Stuart, and he came home early. He'll pick her up from kinder and look after her. Until I get home. Linda, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. He's a great guy. I know it's traditional for a bloke to dislike his son-in-law, but you picked so damned well that I just can't help liking him. I chuckled at my daughter's grim smile. We shared a sense of humor. Have you told Pete yet, Dad? No, your brother is at sea at the moment. I'll email him later. Okay, Dad. I'm here for you. You know that. Yeah, thanks, sweetie. We lapsed into silence for a long moment. Why would she do this to you, Dad? I don't know, darling. Why didn't she say anything? Um, I haven't actually spoken to her yet. You mean she's still? Yep. I watched as my daughter's troubled eyes flicked to the stairs leading up to the master bedroom. I just wanted to wait so she could tell us all why she did it at the same time. All. Yeah, I've invited a few more guests. They should be here shortly. What are you going to do? No more and no less than I have to so I can survive this. So you already have a plan? Yep. Doesn't it depend on her reason? The facts speak for themselves. The reason is irrelevant, but she may have been blackmailed. Believe me, if you saw what I saw and heard what I heard, you'd know she wasn't being blackmailed. Linda looked into my eyes for a moment. I thought you were taking this well, but I can see now you're not, are you? No. I turned away. No daughter should see her father cry. What would you like me to do? You do what your conscience tells you to do. I won't think better or worse about you whichever way you decide. Thanks, Dad. Do you have any idea why she would do this? I have absolutely no idea, sweetie. I thought we had a good marriage until this morning. What happened this morning? Well, your mother has always been lossy at lying and keeping secrets. It's just not in her nature. After 27 years of living together, I know her routines like my own. She showers every morning. Every Tuesday and Friday, she washes her hair. She'll be getting ready for five minutes more or less than an hour every other day. This morning, she was in there for almost an hour and a half. When I went in to tell her she would be late for work, I saw what underwear she had on and what she was planning to wear. It wasn't her usual office clothes. I asked her what her plans were for the day, and she said nothing unusual, just work. She was lying. Every other day she thought she would be late for work. She got kind of agitated. This morning, she was as cool as a cucumber. I knew then that she had no intention of going to work. So what did you do? I called off work and parked just up the street. I was going to follow her when she left, but she didn't go anywhere. I stayed there until that guy she works with at the real estate office turned up at about 11.30. I crept in and confirmed it was what I expected, then thought about what I was going to do next. I made a few phone calls, and here we are. Were there any clues, D? I mean before today. I thought you guys were good. No, sweetie, nothing as far as I knew. I loved her and she loved me. We were going to work for a few more years, then retire and live happily ever after. Dad, I have to ask you this. Did you ever? Don't even say it, Linda. No, I have never betrayed your mother. I have never disrespected a woman that way in my life. Even when our sex life pretty much died a couple of years ago, I just sucked it up. What? You haven't had sex in two years. Nope. Your mother was never an overly sexual being. She reckoned she just didn't enjoy it that much. Sure, she seemed to enjoy it when we started, but it was the starting that was the problem. When she hit menopause two years ago, whatever I used to get just dried up completely. So when you found her today, you know it must have hit you hard. 
I let my steely gaze answer for me. Just then, there was another soft knock on the door. I opened the door to see my father-in-law standing there. Come in, Paul, I said. Thanks, Dave. Where is she? Upstairs in our bedroom. Okay, I have to see for myself. I understand. Go ahead, sir. Just don't disturb her, please. The old man went up the stairs and came down a minute later, but looking much older. He slumped into a chair, and I poured him a whiskey, which he gulped down. I can't believe she would do that to you. She knows how devastated you were when that fiancé of yours cheated on you. She helped pick up the pieces after all. Not only that, she knows how devastated I was when I caught her mother, and she ran off, abandoning me and the kids. Sorry, I have to get out of here. I guess a woman shouldn't see her granddad cry either. I walked him to the door. Linda looked like she was going to follow us. But I waved her back. I wanted the old guy to maintain whatever pride he had left. He stood on the porch and gripped my shoulders for support. Do what you have to do, son, but nothing physical, okay? I couldn't stand by and, and see that. Don't worry, Dad, I won't harm a hair on your daughter's head. But as for the other, I apologize for what I'm about to do. A guy has to do what he has to do. He stared at me for a long moment, then nodded. He shuffled to his car and drove slowly away, a broken man. I called his son, my wife's brother, and without going into detail, suggested he go see his dad to offer support. I was just hanging up when I heard the upstairs toilet flush. Ah, nap time must be over, I thought. I rejoined Linda, and we sat in silence for a few minutes. Shortly after, we heard a bed creaking and sounds of passion. See, Linda, does that sound like blackmail to you? No, Dad, how can you stand to sit here? Why don't you go up and beat those assholes? Well, it's not easy, sweetie, but I have this ability to turn off my emotional side, kind of disassociate myself from all the feelings, you know. Oh, is that where I get it from? So why torture yourself? Why not go upstairs and stop it? Kick the whore out. Um, there's one more visitor to come, right on cue. There was another knock on the door. I opened it to a reasonably looking lady, a few years younger than me. Surprisingly, she had a boy and a girl with her, who looked to be in their mid to late teens. Mr. Brown. Yes, please call me Dave. I'm Jenny Smith, and these are my kids, Robert and Sarah. I picked them up from school. If what you say is true, I wanted them here for no other reason than to understand that it was their father who destroyed our family. I shook hands with Robert. His grip was surprisingly firm. I introduced them all to Linda. You said you had proof, Dave. In response, I walked over to the pants lying on the arm of the couch and pulled out a wallet. I handed it to Jenny. She opened it and looked at the driver's license. A tear escaped her eye. I guess she had harbored some hope that what I'd said on the phone was wrong. Her face suddenly hardened. Well, Dave, where are they? In response, I just held my finger to my lips in the international symbol for silence. We sat there, listening to the grunts and groans. Son of a bitch, you haven't confronted them yet. No, I wanted us to do it as a team, as it were. I just took some video for us, which I'm happy to share with you. I also set up a voice recorder and slipped it under the bed. We can go now if you like. I suggest the children hold back until we can get the performers decent. Yes, you're right. Just hold on a moment. I have a locksmith standing by to change the locks on my house. I was just waiting to make sure you were right before giving them the go. I'm not surprised, really. This isn't the first time. He's a smooth-talking little fool. Linda and I waited patiently while she rang the locksmith and then her lawyer, giving them both the go-ahead. We distracted her children from the noises by chatting about trivial matters. Jenny then pushed her shoulders back. Okay, let's do this. Jenny, Linda, and I ascended the stairs while the kids waited below for our cue. After Jenny peeked through the doorway, I signaled the others to remain hidden and then stepped into the room. I stood at the foot of the bed, feeling the wave of disgust as I observed the scene. Earlier, they had been in a standard position, 
but now he was taking her from behind. I watched with detachment as he continued, while she expressed her satisfaction with constant moans. She had refused this position with me shortly after our wedding, saying it was degrading. Suddenly, she cried out in pleasure and collapsed onto the bed. He gave her a moment to recover, the considerate jerk, before continuing his actions with her lying still. Stop, please, John. I'm sore. Let me take care of you another way. She hadn't done that with me since the incident with the rock that injured her ring finger. As she turned onto her back and rolled over, our eyes met. Her expression changed instantly, and she screamed. Her lover followed her gaze and saw me standing there. He began to get up, looking absurd with his exposed self. Once he was on his feet, he paused and looked up at my face, and I could tell he was starting to fear for his safety. That's right. I'm bigger and uglier than you, and please believe me, angrier. Why don't you just get back into bed and cover up yourself and my ex-wife? He was an obedient dog, if nothing else. Within seconds, they were lying side by side under the covers. I noted that Tracy's expression had shifted from shock to defiance. I let her speak first. Um, Dave, I want a divorce. I've fallen in love with Joe. The guy here, I'm sorry you had to find out like this. We were going to tell you tomorrow, it's okay. Dear, I'm sorry you had to find out like this. We were going to tell you tomorrow. It's okay, dear. By the way, I was eventually going to find out his name was John Smith, wasn't I? I could see this shock them. Not the smartest move to leave your wallet in your pants pocket downstairs, Tracy. Just idle curiosity. But why did you end our marriage this way? You had to know catching you cheating would devastate me. Finally, I saw some shame on her face. I'm sorry, David. We couldn't help falling in love. I accept that, dear. You could have avoided putting the cart before the horse, though. You could have dealt with this prick before announcing you wanted a divorce, couldn't you? I'm sorry, David. I just wanted to know that Joe and I were compatible. We didn't want you to see us like this. If it helps, this was the first time. What? A test drive of the new model. Sort of like trying him out for size. Don't be crude, David. I don't want to end our marriage fighting. Can't we just part as friends? This almost got through my mental defenses. I was guessing that under the pressure of the situation, she was quoting from tomorrow's pre-rehearsed speech. You've got to be kidding. You're lying in my bed with another guy's mess still on you. And you want to part as friends. That's not going to happen. We stared at each other until Tracy dropped her eyes. I decided it was time to start evening the score. Your dad asked me to tell you how disappointed he is in you. He kind of hoped you wouldn't turn out as big a whore as your mother. You didn't. Tracy's face went sheet white. I did. I'm surprised you didn't see him. He was standing right here not half an hour ago. Why? Because I wanted you to start feeling some of the pain I've been feeling since shit stain here showed up. I don't know what the kids will make of it all. Oh God, Dave, please don't tell the kids. Sorry, dear, too late. Linda chose that exact moment to step into view in the doorway. Tracy glanced over at the movement, squealed, and then buried her face under the sheets. Don't bother, Mom. It doesn't work for ostriches. And it won't work for you. Tracy just stayed under the sheets, moaning. Her bed partner looked really uncomfortable. When Dad rang me, I gave you the benefit of the doubt. I couldn't believe you would do this to him. I can see why he rang me now. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I might have urged him to forgive you. But seeing you like this, I know that's never going to happen. Silence, apart from deep, racking sobs, was the only reply. Well, mother, if you have nothing left to say, I'll say it all. We won't be needing you to babysit your granddaughter this weekend. In fact, if cutting you off from seeing her will keep her safe from your poisonous influence, then you can kiss goodbye to ever seeing her again. There was a pitiful moan from under the sheets. Linda was sobbing herself now. You should have seen the look on poor old Grandad's face before you devastated him. She turned to run, but I grabbed her and hugged her. She pulled away and ran downstairs. Shortly afterward, we all heard the front door slam. It was a couple of minutes before Tracy re-emerged with red eyes. 
Why did you have to do that, David? Because you haven't felt half the pain I have yet, Tracy. You haven't felt like you've had your heart ripped out and stomped on, but you will, I assure you of that. Now I'm sick of this charade. Just get the hell out of my house, both of you. Again, the look of defiance returned to Tracy's face. If anyone is leaving this house, it's going to be you. I had the power of attorney you gave me in case anything happened to you, and I used it to transfer the deeds into my name only. I think the vehemence of her own voice even surprised Tracy. She could certainly see by my face that by revealing another of her betrayals, she had made me even angrier. She also realized that morally she was just digging her grave deeper and deeper. I recovered quickly. The strange thing is, with shocking news, it stops hurting once it reaches a certain point. I had reached that point two hours ago. How are you going to afford the mortgage, Tracy? You think we didn't work this out, David. With my pay and commissions, plus John's, we cover it easily. What pay is that, Tracy? Your boss, Mr. Johnson, said to tell you both you're fired. He would have told you himself, but apparently, both your phones are off. Good Christian soul that he is. He took a dim view of two married pricks like you cheating on company time. You didn't tell him, did you? Tell me you didn't. Yep, sent him some lovely photographs too. Tracy's bedmate finally found his voice. How do you know I'm married? Driver's license, remember? Phone book, telephone, easy. Wife Jenny, about five feet six inches. Pretty red hair. Children Robert and Sarah look like good kids. Tell me, were you going to shaft them like this bitch was planning on shafting me? Please, Mr. Brown, don't tell my wife. Why not? Haven't you finished draining all your bank accounts yet in preparation for sailing off into the sunset with my wife? She was going to get the house. Just give me a chance to tell her gently, please. She doesn't deserve this. I still love her in my own way. She doesn't deserve to find out like this. What? Doesn't deserve to find out like I did? You mean? Yes. You're right. Unfortunately, it's too late. I didn't need to turn around to know exactly when Jenny and her children stepped in the door. His face told the story. The expression was priceless. Yes, it's way too late, my darling husband. I will be eternally grateful to Mr. Brown here for bringing this to my attention. Just so you know, the video he is giving me should be enough to trigger the post -nop. We had drawn up last time I forgave you. Tracy's head swung to look at her bed partner. In my disassociated state, I idly wondered whether it was the fact that he was a serial cheater or the news that their financial plans were now scuppered that was affecting him the most. The lock should have been changed on my house by now. If you want to stop by in the morning to collect your things, they will be in the dumpster. I intend to hire a locksmith this afternoon. Throughout this, the unfortunate John had just looked at his own feet with an expression of horror. I found out later that it had been him who initially seduced Tracy, but the test drive had been her idea. His plan had actually been to tell his wife and family the next day as well. He looked forlornly at his wife, then glanced briefly at his kids, but couldn't face them for long. Jenny was losing control, but rallied briefly. Well, kids, if you ever wondered what a whore looks like, then take a good look. Tracy cringed under their combined stare. Jenny grabbed the kids and stormed out. I walked to the bed and snarled at the cowering couple. Just get out of my house. You have no idea of the rage I'm feeling right now. I'll return in two hours. I want you both gone when I get back. Don't even think about trying to rip me off, Tracy. If you do, then your chances of living happily ever after, no, make that living period, will plummet from very, very small to non-existent. Understand? One look at my face convinced them of the seriousness of what I intended. I ran after Jenny and caught her before she drove off. We agreed to meet at a coffee shop, which we did. We consoled each other and tried to lead the kids through the process to come. Robert proved to be mature beyond his years and helped comfort his sodding sister. I really wish her father was here to see his daughter's pain. I gave Jenny my card and offered to help her with anything I could. We parted as friends. 
The next week was very hard. Yes, I can turn off my emotions in a crisis. However, that doesn't stop the pain. It only defers it. Sure, I was busy with work and lawyers. They were very interested in my evidence, particularly the voice recorder I retrieved from under the bed. It had picked up fairly clear conversations, where the two lovers detailed the extent of their planning to snatch the majority of the marital assets of the two households. Tracy was justifying it as her right, and because of my earning capacity. The assumption in divorces is usually an equal split, but my lawyer informed me that judges have the capacity to deviate from this and evidence of pre-planned skullduggery often sways them that way. Linda insisted on hearing the recordings as well. We were both stunned by her mother's planned vindictiveness. Linda actually rang her mother for an explanation, but got nothing to convince her that it wasn't just pure evil. I put on a brave face for Linda and a brave voice for my son when he called, but I was struggling. The weekend after the show, I got a very welcome call from Jenny. She was very happy to mow her own lawn, but had no idea how the mower worked. After some lessons on Sunday and doing some other small maintenance jobs, I was invited to stay for dinner. We were still chatting when the kids went to bed. Then things turned serious. How are you doing, Jenny? About as well as could be expected, Dave. Thanks for asking. I think I've been mentally preparing myself for this for years. Deep down, I knew it would happen again. My lawyers have discovered what he had planned for our finances and blocked it all. I couldn't believe the little prick was going to leave us practically penniless. The lawyers are telling me that I'll get the house, child support, and alimony, plus 90% of the assets, thanks to your evidence and the post -nop. Happy to be of service, Jen. My lawyer said something similar, but with only 50 to 70% of the assets. He came around two days ago begging. I think his lawyers told him the same things mine did, and the idea of being financially screwed terrifies him. I told him to piss off. The only thing that worries me is the effect on the kids. Sarah is at an age where she can develop fine without a father, but I'm worried about Rob. I know Jen, at his age, a boy needs a good, strong male role model. I've been thinking about that. Can I volunteer for the job? I'd be honored to come into his life and help where I can. Jenny was silent for a long moment. I could see the conflict in her face. Um, I know your ego must be a little fragile at the moment, Dave, so I don't quite know how. Don't worry about it, Jen. Support for Rob is all I'm offering at the moment. I could see the relief flutter across her face. We discussed details for a while. How about you, Dave? Are you okay? I don't know, Jen. I'm still confused as all hell. I don't know what I did to make her hate me so much. Finding her with your John just emasculated me. It makes me doubt my own manhood. Was I so inadequate? I just don't know. Destroying her relationship with her kids her father, probably our mutual friends, combined with getting her fired, just doesn't seem enough somehow. I still feel like only half a man. Believe me, I know exactly how you feel, Dave. Jenny stared at me for another long moment, obviously debating what to say. Finally, she continued, you know what you have to do to reclaim your manhood, don't you, Dave? Jenny was leaning towards me with steely eyes. Yes, yes I do, Jen. Good. How far are you comfortable with me going? Jen's steel was now in her voice as well. Hell, really does have no fury like a woman scorned. As far as you think you need to go to get rid of your demons, Dave is fine with me. You're too nice a guy to allow any lingering hurt to mess with the rest of your life. Let it all out, Dave. Okay. I'll need an alibi. You'll have one. Believe me. When she told me what she had in mind for an alibi, we both laughed for a long time. Boy, I needed that. We resumed talking. This conversation was only half over. What about me, Jen? Do you feel you need some revenge on Tracy? Good Lord, no. I know what a smooth-talking little prick he can be. Your poor wife didn't stand a chance. I almost feel sorry for her. We parted as friends, and she promised to talk to Rob about whether or not he was interested in helping restore an old car I had. He was, 
and that set the pattern for the next six weeks. After school, he would come to my place, and we would putter around. I used every opportunity to talk to him about my ideas and values, and we became firm buddies. After I took him home, it was a different matter. I used all my free time to spy on the happy couple. With our bank accounts frozen by the lawyers, John and Tracy couldn't get a place of their own. Tracy was staying with one of her few remaining friends, and John was doing the same with one of his. They spent most evenings together before going their separate ways late at night. Finally, I had established enough of a pattern that I rang Jenny one Thursday night and announced that the next night was it. She arranged for the kids to go to her parents for the night. I drove to her place and parked in her driveway. After a kiss on the lips and a give him one from me, I wheeled an old motorbike of John's out the back gate and started it a block away from her house. Once at his friend's place, I looked around, then quietly shot out the street light with my air pistol. After that, it was just a matter of waiting in the bushes at the side of his friend's driveway. He surprised me by breaking routine. He arrived by cab forty minutes later, rather than by car. The reason became clear when I saw his unsteady steps coming down the driveway. He'd been drinking. Now, hitting has never been in my nature. My sense of honor demanded a fair fight. Well, fairish anyway. About as fair as screwing the guy's wife, when he didn't even know you existed. I stepped in front of him. Hi, John. He froze. Then, in the dim light, I saw recognition dawn in his eyes. He certainly didn't react the way I thought he would. Well, they don't call it Dutch courage for nothing, I suppose. Well, if it isn't the guy who couldn't keep his woman in check. Very bad move on his part. Instantly, my careful plan of a limited assault went out the window. The wrong beast pounced. A right to the jaw knocked him to his hands and knees. Then my memory got a bit hazy. From later reports, I think I kicked him in the ribs a few times, stomped his kidneys and lower legs, before landing a few well-aimed kicks between his legs. Luckily, my red haze lifted, allowing me to complete the last part of my plan. I lifted his unconscious form and dumped him in the middle of the road. Maybe the police would think he was another hapless hit-and-run victim. Maybe not. I walked back to the motorbike and rode to a shopping center. In the shadows, I changed clothes and dumped them, as well as my gloves, in a dumpster. Finally, I rode a block away from Jenny's house and pushed the bike back. Jenny was expectantly awaiting my return and grilled me on how things had gone. She didn't seem that upset that I had overstepped my plan in my rage. Upset people don't normally grin like Cheshire cats when they've been wronged. When she had every sort of detail, I excused myself to hit her shower and get rid of any potential evidence. I checked my knuckles for bruises. All good. My eyes were closed as I was rinsing my hair when I felt a cool breeze, then warm skin. A pair of arms encircled me from behind. I thought you didn't want this. Screw what I want. You need this. You've taken the man. Now you need to take his woman. I spun around and we kissed. Boy, I needed that. We finally broke apart. Besides, when the police come to check your alibi, I want to be as convincing as possible. Now finish up, you great lummox, and get in the bedroom. Who was I to deny the request of a lady? Still damp, I threw her on the bed and claimed her. I'm usually proud of my consideration as a lover. There was none of that tonight. I took her as long and as hard as I could. If I'm any judge, she loved it as well. I awoke in the pre-dawn light as I felt her slip back into bed. She snuggled up to me. I'm sorry, Jen. I was tired last night. I hope you weren't too disappointed. If that was you in second gear, God help me if I ever get your third. We both dozed for a few more minutes. I awoke to breakfast and coffee being delivered. Hey Dave, some arsehole broke the back window of your car last night. I've already phoned the police, she said accompanied by a wink. Sure enough, the police came around, and my number plate was entered into their system. Before long, it was linked to a reported potential assault from the previous night. It was convenient that my alibi and I were together in a house reeking of sex. 
The nosy neighbor backed up our story of my car being parked there at the time of the assault, as it had been once a week for the last few months. She wasn't to know that I wasn't in the spare room as usual. I was never a serious suspect. I did see Tracy one more time about a week after her lover's bad night. She rang to say she was coming over to get the rest of her stuff. When I explained that it had all been donated to charity, she said she wanted to talk anyway. When I heard her car pull up, I looked out the window to see Tracy standing next to her car on the phone. I answered the door in my dressing gown. When she finally knocked, she frowned at my choice of apparel, but I made sure my face betrayed nothing as I invited her in. I asked her to hand over her phone and handbag, then put them in a spare room and closed the door. She was smart enough to guess that I suspected she might try to record this conversation. With what she was wearing, she couldn't be concealing a recording device in her clothes. We settled into chairs on either side of the kitchen table. Dave, you should know that I've arranged with a friend that if I don't call within 60 minutes, she'll send the police here. I nodded at her wise precaution, but remained silent. I had only one thing to say to her, and it could wait. Dave, could I just say how sorry I am for how our marriage ended? Save your breath, Tracy. I'm not the slightest bit interested in sitting here listening to you trying to appease your conscience by justifying why you tried to destroy me. The expression on her face was priceless. It was like she was thinking, who is this guy? Okay, Dave, it was you who beat up John, wasn't it? Yes, that caught her completely off guard. She obviously expected me to deny it. What's so hard to understand, Tracy? You asked me if I'd beaten him up. I said yes, it was me. But why? He'd never done anything to you. Come on, Tracy. Extramarital sex can't have rotted your brain that quickly. When I saw you spreading your legs for him, it completely emasculated me. It destroyed my confidence as a man, made me doubt my ability to satisfy a woman, and robbed me of my pride. She was shocked. I'm guessing she'd never considered this aspect of what she'd done. That's what cheating does, you know. After a while, I realized I had two choices. I could end up a sad, lonely old man like your dad, a sexless, vacant hulk, or I could fight my way out of the corner that you and your lover pushed me into. Does it really surprise you that I chose the man's option, the only option that would allow me to remain a man? Yes, I destroyed your boyfriend, and if I feel it's necessary to hold my head up high, then I'll do it again and again. You forced the showdown. Tracy, there can only be one survivor. To stop you and him from destroying me, I have to destroy you both. The words were said with such quiet, chilling certainty that they left no room for doubt. Oh, but I hope that by completely isolating me from friends and family and getting me fired, you were done with me. John and I just fell in love, Dave. We couldn't help it. You can remember being in love, can't you? Yes, Tracy, I can remember back eight weeks. As I said that day, maybe it wasn't your choice to fall in love, but it was your choice what you did about it. If you just come to me and said, Dave, I've fallen in love with someone else. I want a divorce. Then I would have been sad, but would have gladly given you your freedom or fought to regain your love, whichever I chose at the time. By announcing your intentions the way you did, viciously and cruelly, you declared war on me, betrayed everything I stand for, and everything I thought you stood for. What about now, Dave? Can you leave John and me in peace now that you've had your revenge? Yes, I think I can, if only because I can't think of anything else to destroy. Thank you, Dave. Don't get excited, Tracy. I'm not the one you should be worried about. Ha! Huh. No, I've had my revenge on Johnny Boy. His wife hasn't started on you yet. If I were you, I'd look out for her. She's one mean lady. I can tell you. At that moment, a disembodied female voice floated down the stairs from the master bedroom. Are you coming back to bed, Dave? You promised me six orgasms a day, and you're under budget. Who is that? Tracy asked. Jenny, I yelled, running towards me with a warning not to go to the police again. I climbed the stairs to find a fully clothed Jenny. She held me until the tremors ceased. 
As for Tracy, she took off to places far away, and I never tried to find or contact her again. Like I said, Dave's the name, and I feel great. I've read somewhere that some people who get revenge on someone who has wronged them find it a hollow experience. For me, it's the most effective cure for depression I've ever heard about. Screw it. Time to stop dwelling on the past. It's too negative. My new life awaits. Jenny and I never became an item. We did use each other to relieve our frustrations fairly regularly, but there was never the necessary spark to go to the next stage. We were good friends, though, and looked out for each other. Under our combined guidance, Rob and Sarah turned out well. I backed off when potential boyfriends were around her and stayed out of her bed until their relationship ended. One or two of them were a little intimidated by me, as I told them that if they hurt her in any way, they would have me to answer to. Before the last one proposed to her, he actually asked my permission. He was a great guy, and I happily blessed their union. The wedding was very emotional. With her father gone, she asked me to walk her down the aisle. It was at the wedding that she introduced me to an old friend of hers who had flown in with her. With my self-administered therapy complete, I was well balanced enough to consider asking Jenny to give me away at my wedding. Well, why not? Without the payback I exacted on the two cheaters, would I have recovered enough to lead a normal life? Hell no. Now, Let's look at the story from Tracy's side. Hello, I'm Tracy, and my life has gone to hell in a handbasket in the last two years. I think I can justify what I did back then. It's going to take some time to justify what I did last week, though. Sorry, I'll explain. Looking back on it, my life with Dave was good. However, it had gone stale. The only thrill I had left was my first granddaughter. So when John started to show an interest in me as a woman, I felt like a teenager again. He was attentive and caring, and what can I say? He swept me off my feet. I knew what we had was wrong deep down, but it just felt so damn good. Our relationship followed the normal pattern of conversations, dates, and making out. I can't remember guilt ever being an issue. By the time we crossed the line and kissed, I already knew that I loved him and he loved me. We planned to leave our respective spouses and marry. A friend of mine, Carol, had been through a messy divorce and explained that her ex had taken control of all the assets at the outset and made it very difficult for her even to engage a lawyer. That's why John and I quietly seized control of everything. I didn't know how his wife would react, but I was fairly sure that my Dave wouldn't be happy. We'd often talked about what constituted cheating, and I realized I was going to be well over the line already before John, and I made our announcement. I fully intended to give Dave whatever the courts demanded after the divorce. I just wanted to be in the driver's seat and protect myself from any retaliation. It was also Carol who asked me if I had slept with John yet. I'd never really enjoyed lovemaking that much, but a girl needs to think she's still attractive. I knew my husband still found me attractive. He nagged me for a cuddle often enough. If only I'd still had the same spark for Dave that I had with John, the whole mess could have been avoided. So anyway, Carol put doubts in my head. What if John was really small or lasted five seconds or something? When I did occasionally need sex, I wanted it to be good, didn't I? At my stage in life, sex was more about emotional connection than physical. I didn't expect John to be as good as Dave. Dave was considerate, gentle, and filled me up nicely. That's what led to my final disastrous betrayal of my marriage. My first session with John was thus a twofold exercise. One, to try him out, and two, as a final bonding exercise to steel ourselves for the emotionally difficult tasks we had planned over the next few days. Being honest with myself, I think I'd wanted to snare John's full attention, so he wouldn't back out of our plans. Even then, I suspected he was quite a weak person. I know what you're thinking. Did I ignore the possibility of getting caught and making Dave go ballistic? Did I consider the effect on my father and kids? The simple answer is no. I never expected to be caught. And if I was, I never expected Dave's nuclear response. As for the rest, I just didn't think of it. 
I never compared myself to my mother. I was so young when she left us that she didn't come into the equation. After all, it cost me. I'd like to say that the sex with John was mind-blowing, but it wasn't. He wasn't tiny, but nowhere near Dave's caliber. He lasted a decent amount of time, but since I dried up after a few minutes, it just became uncomfortable. I found myself faking enjoyment, just as I used to do with Dave. Men and their bloody egos, I ask you. I still have no idea how Dave found out about my one and only infidelity. It's just not important to me anymore. I was devastated when I saw the look of hurt in his eyes when he came into the room. I tried to justify it to myself later, but of course I couldn't. He'd never done anything bad enough to justify that. My guilt manifested itself as defiance for a very short time. But that didn't last long. The thought that my father had witnessed my transgression, and my daughter's words just killed me. The look in John's daughter's eyes was almost as bad. I had no idea my husband was capable of such cruelty. When I was called by the hospital about John's admission, I knew instinctively that it was Dave's doing. The doctors believed that John's broken jaw, concussion, bruised kidneys, three broken ribs, cracked tibia, and shattered groin were consistent with a hit-and-run accident. I believed differently. That's why I rang the police and gave them Dave's name and car license plate number. When I rang back two days later, they said he was no longer a person of interest. That's why I hadn't left John's side for the week he was in the hospital. I knew he needed my protection. Until eight weeks ago, if you'd asked me if my Dave could do such a thing, I'd have said no way. For fifteen minutes in my old bedroom, I caught a glimpse of the new monster Dave, a monster that I knew I had created, a monster that was more than capable of unlimited cruelty. Yes, I just knew it had been Dave. That's why, just before John was discharged, I rang Dave and arranged to meet at our old house. This had to stop. Hadn't he had enough revenge yet? John and I were both destroyed. It felt sad walking up to my front door, not as sad as I knew the conversation to come was going to be. How had I gone from loving a man to thinking of him as the enemy in such a short time? Before I rang the bell, I phoned Carol and told her that if she didn't hear from me in an hour, she should call the police. Dave answered the door in his dressing gown, which was unusual. He wore no expression as he invited me in. When he asked me to hand over my phone and handbag, I kicked myself for not thinking of bringing a recorder. Then I asked myself why. He was never going to admit to the assault. I stared briefly at the stranger I had known for over twenty-seven years. I did feel remorse for how our marriage ended by explaining how I'd fallen. I hoped to ease his pain and maybe get him to back off a little, but he shut me down as soon as I began. He wasn't interested in the why. His tone was harsh and his facial expression blank. Who is this guy? I didn't recognize the face or the voice. I was stunned when he bluntly admitted to beating up John. When I heard his motivation, I could see exactly why he'd done it. Let's just say it didn't ease my conscience any. I genuinely didn't see why Dave hated John so much, but he set me straight on that very quickly. I suddenly realized how self-centered I had become. It had blinded me and allowed me to rationalize the completely unacceptable. I suddenly knew not only why we were being punished, but judging by the expression on Dave's face, it wasn't over. My asking if he remembered what love felt like was part of my prepared speech. His answer was like a knife twisting in my gut. How else could a fundamentally decent person feel? I knew I had to run. My question about future revenge was simply to see how far he would go. I hadn't considered that John's wife was a physical threat until Dave's words. With a flash of insight, I suddenly found myself in her shoes. What would I do if she did to me what I'd done to her? The chill went down my spine when I discovered she was upstairs. I ran. I collected John from the hospital, and then we both ran. The divorces were both finalized, and the paperwork was delivered to our P.O. box two towns away from my new home. The stress of living anonymously with no friends and constantly looking over my shoulder was tremendous. We had a little money, but eventually, the waiting was tough. 
The only jobs we could get were commission-only real estate jobs, and it was a long time between drinks. John and I got married six months later. Looking back on it, we were two castaways thrown together, and it was a mistake. I also think one of the motivations was that by getting married, we could retrospectively justify the pain we had caused so many, especially ourselves. My latest downfall started innocuously enough. John's one remaining testicle never did work. He was totally incapable of having an erection. We never could afford the course of testosterone treatment required to alleviate the problem, which made him moody, insecure, and jealous. Let's face it, a marriage that has infidelity as its cornerstone is an uphill battle right from the start. His grouchiness caused me to become very unfriendly as well. A friend of mine recommended HRT therapy as it had fixed her similar condition. I balked at the probable cost, but she explained that since every second woman over 45 was on it, it was much cheaper than testosterone therapy. One doctor's visit later, and as if by a miracle, life returned to a happy normal. My doctor had warned me that one of the side effects of estrogen tablets was a resurgence of my libido. He said it with a smirk like it was a good thing. However, when it happens to the wife of a man with erectile dysfunction, it is very destructive. I found myself hornier than I had been since five years into my marriage to Dave. John refused my pleas. Oral sex and self-pleasure can only get you by so much. I learned quickly to hide my vibrators from John, as they set him off something shocking. When the guy at my new work started showing an interest in me, I couldn't help but respond. He was much younger than me, and it was very flattering. Hiding our dates was extremely stressful. John was much harder to fool than Dave had been. The first time we kissed was like an electric shock, not from the thrill of it, but because of the strong deja vu experience it elicited. I refused to go through that again. I refused to cheat. I thought long and hard, but finally came up with a solution. It was less than ideal. But John had to respect my drives, didn't he? So, I sat John down last Thursday night, and as gently as possible, told him that I wouldn't be home Friday night. I needed to take a lover. I promised I would be discreet, that it was only sex, and that I would never rub his nose in it. I took his silence Thursday night and Friday morning as reluctant acquiescence. After buying me dinner and a disappointingly short sex session, my new lover fell asleep in embarrassment. I went home to John in the trailer, but he wasn't there. The wail of sirens alerted me to the fact that Dawn had revealed him swinging from a tree. I'd done it again, destroyed a man. I braced for the payback. I knew he had organized. I was surprised to find it only consisted of a suicide note and a letter to his attorney. The suicide note was emailed to all our friends, who dumped me quicker than an airplane toilet. The letter to his attorney was to change the beneficiaries of his life insurance policy and his will for me to his children. When will I ever learn? Never mess with a man's pride. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.